So I think he can also have the claim to fame for XAI, right? The term the X in the explainable AI. And more importantly, I think on his first or second tour, he was also running the PAL program, the personalized assistant that learns. So, you know, you, you saw probably all the intelligent agent, intelligent assistant sessions here at the conference, and that predates that. So that was one of the first kind of initiatives on uh, intelligent assistants that got commercialized by something that everyone has, or most of you have on their phone, is Siri, right? At DARPA, they call Dave actually father of Siri, so. <laughs> and uh, he also did tours at, I think, SET Corp, Sci Corp, Vulcan Park, right? So um, it's actually a great honor to have him here today. And without further ado, I think he will give us an introduction or a status of explainable AI. So thanks, Dave. Very good. Great. Yeah, thanks, Oliver. That was a pretty nice introduction. That glass of wine I bought you paid off, I think. That might be it. Um, so I'm going to tell you about this explainable AI program I'm running now at DARPA, which uh, we started. It's about halfway through. It's a four-year program. We're just about halfway through, you know, so I can give you some kind of uh, report on things people are trying and, and where we are, although, you know, it's an ambitious effort. It, as you can imagine, DARPA now has a huge emphasis on AI, but also has a big emphasis on using AI for human-machine symbiosis. So that's why, how XAI was created. They really, you know, are trying to see how can AI be best used as a partner for um, knowledge workers, people in the services, and that sort of thing. And uh, if you don't know, uh, program managers at DARPA come from just a four-year tour. It's the way they keep things fresh, is they don't let people come there and stay forever. So they're constantly refreshing with new people and new ideas. So actually, if you're at the right point in your career, you think you could spend four years in Arlington, Virginia, and you're interested in AI and human-machine symbiosis, you know, let us know. I bet there's really, it's a great job if you don't mind living on the East Coast and uh, you really get to do some interesting, some interesting work. So with that, let me talk a little bit about XAI. Uh, here, everybody now knows the motivation for the program, right? When we started it three years ago, it wasn't always clear. People would ask, why do you need to explain these systems, right? And it was, seemed to be endlessly fascinating to the press that AI needed to be explained, right? So. Uh, it seems like one of the most influential things I did was created the acronym XAI. I think that's where the X first came from. So now I can retire having had that influence on the community. Um, but the need is, you know, pretty, we've had this explosion of machine learning AI systems, especially deep learning now, being applied everywhere. Uh, but these models are opaque and difficult for users to understand. In a lot of cases, that's okay. It doesn't matter. If you're finding cat videos on Facebook, I'm not sure that, you know, it's critical to get an explanation. But certainly if you're in the Defense Department or finance or medicine, right, you know, these explanations become a lot more important. And one of our lead researchers, actually, now he's been working on the program for one of our principal investigators for two years. He had an amazing anecdote, his experience with unexplainable AI was he went into the doctor for his annual physical. And a week later, of course, the nurse calls him up with the results and goes through the, his numbers, which were seemed to be okay. And then she said, have you heard of algorithms? And, <laughs> and he said, well, yes, I, I work with algorithms. I know about that. Well, our algorithm says you should start taking statins. And his cholesterol was not high. So he's like, why? why, why, why? Why? And she says, well, um, we don't know. That's what the algorithm recommended. And he said, well, what's the algorithm based on? She says, well, age and gender mostly. And he said, well, do you always recommend statins for everybody that's a male my age? And she said, no, only if the algorithm recommends it. <laughs> and said, you know, we get a number out of the algorithm, and yours was 12.5. And if anything over a nine, we recommend you take statins. 
And then he went through a whole dialogue with, he was on high blood pressure medicine. He just stopped that, and they took out the blood pressure out of his profile, and the number dropped to 9.5, but was still high enough that he should take them. So I think in the end, he just decided to just take them to be safe, but it was always kind of a mystery exactly why the algorithm had recommended that. So that's the kind of story you hear a lot of these days, right? There's a lot of people using these systems, and a lot of people won't use the systems if they don't have some explanation, right? That's, you know, for reasons like that. So that's our goal, is to try to do something to this technology to make it more understandable to the end user. Here's how I characterize, you know, the, the standard supervised machine learning process today, which is, you know, the basis of this technology that's being applied everywhere. You have a lot of training data, generally a lot of labeled training data. You feed that to a learning process. You then get a learned function or a model. And there's a variety of these, although, of course, deep learning is the one that's really paid off, that's really in vogue today. You can get a very large, complicated model. And unlike this simplified one I have here with five or six layers, they can have thousands of layers, millions of nodes or neurons, right? And each one is learning concepts in a way by the weights and the equations that it learns at each node. So it does a pretty good job of prediction, but the, uh, the system really has no idea how to describe the concepts that it's using. So in this simple example, now we've trained this system to recognize objects. We feed it this photo, and sure enough, it says this is a cat. But if you want an explanation on why do you think it's a cat, much like our, my friend at the doctor, it says, well, the weight on the cat node is 0.93, and that's about all you'll get out of it. And so that leaves the user, if he, if he cares, wanting to know why did you make that recommendation, why not something else. Even more importantly, what are your strengths and weaknesses? When should I trust you? When shouldn't I trust you? That's one of our real goals of the program, is to help the user have appropriate trust and know when he can depend on the system and when not. Well, that's a very, it's a very ambitious goal, but that's what we're trying to get at. So here's how we're changing, you know, the broad strategy for what we want to do to help this situation is to change this process in two ways. One is have a modified machine learning process, you know, so that it produces something that's more explainable, right? It extracts out some features, can identify training examples, you know, there's a variety of ways which I'll show you the program and several of the people that presented papers yesterday were working on, on how can you make these systems a little bit more explainable, pull some semantic features out of the net, make the net more structured, maybe use a different learning technique produces a more structured model. So there's a variety of techniques people can try. And then the second is to add the right uh, human-computer interaction to it so you can create this explanation interface that takes the features or the ideas, the concepts that come out of the explainable model and translate that into an understandable dialogue for the end user. And our target here is the end user who's probably an expert in his domain. He's using this decision tool, but he's not an expert in machine learning or statistics. So you're trying to explain to him what are the important features or ideas or examples the system is using to make that decision. So here's how I've characterized the overall goal of the program. To start with, I think there's this notional graph. I think there is some inherent trade-off between the competency or the learning performance of the AI system and how explainable it is, right? The most complex deep learning system is going to be inherently more difficult to explain than a decision tree or logistics regression. And that's what I mean by these orange dots on the curve. Much like people, you can have ones that are completely brilliant but unable to explain anything to a normal person. Or you can have people that make great instructors even though they're not the most recognized researcher in the field. So you have something like that going on with machine learning techniques. So I don't believe we're going to create something out in this corner. We're not going to have perfect explanations for the most complex deep learning system, but the goal of the program is to create a portfolio of techniques so we move this curve up and to the right. 
So if a future developer can look at the trade-off between learning performance and explainability for new application, and he'll have better techniques to use to do a better job of satisfying that trade-off for his particular application. So for the program, we're using these two kind of motivating use cases or challenge problems. They're clearly designed to be relevant to the Department of Defense that DARPA cares about, but also clearly apply to all sorts of commercial you know, and civilian applications. So one is data analytics, especially on multimedia data, right? So we you know, have analysts in the government who pour over huge volumes of images and video you know, from North Korea or Syria or whatever, where it's critical that they get automated help to help them sift through all that information. But when they get a recommendation from the system that, oh, this is something you should look into, that analyst wants some explanation on why. And actually, before the program began, I was at a workshop with some government analysts. And uh, one of the analysts there, and this was a bunch of machine learning people trying to pitch their technology to this analyst. And she said, well, this, is not, this doesn't address my problem. So I already have these big data, data analytics routines that are giving me recommendations. But I have to put my name on the recommendation that goes forward. And if it's wrong, she's blamed not the algorithm, and so she's very reluctant to use these algorithms unless she had some idea what, why it was making the decision. So that's one use case. Of course, that's just the same as the use case you might have for medicine or finance or you know, other cases where you've got a lot of data, you're training the system to make classifications, now you want to know why it's made those decisions. The second use case is a little bit further out, but it's for autonomy. Right, so we now have a, you know, autonomous systems now like uh, self-driving cars that are, you know, out there you know, being developed still. And for the most part, they're still carefully engineered in a lot of software modules where you get some explainability out of it. But the most advanced researchers are now applying deep reinforcement learning to train these systems to have a decision policy, you know, much like what DeepMind did with AlphaGo. Right? So that, that technique will be retraining uh, robotic systems and autonomous systems in the future. And when that happens, an operator may send one of these systems off on a mission, like one of these military cases, sending off a UAV to do surveillance. And if it comes back, he'll want to know, why did you make the decisions you did? Why did you turn around? Why did you or didn't find you know, the target? Right? So that's, that's the goal of the second use case. In the program, we're only looking at simulated autonomy, often in video games or some simulated environment. But we want to see if you have a system that's been trained with this deep learning technology, how can you pull out explainable uh, decision policies out of that? So here's uh, how we've structured the program. As I said, it began you know, two years ago. As DARPA does business, we issued a, a solicitation. We got in a huge number of fantastic proposals. You know, it was very timely, you know, topic of strong interest to the research community. And we have these 11 teams in the list here that are all trying different techniques to provide both of these components, to both have a new learning process that produces a more explainable model and to have the right explanation interface so that can explain its decisions to an end user have three teams that are working on both of those challenge problems, analytics and autonomy, three teams working only on autonomy, five teams working only on analytics. I have uh, one other 12th team up here in the corner, IHMC, who is just a group of cognitive psychologists who are there not to develop a system, but just to dig through all the literature on the psychology of explanation you know, and there's a lot of this in education and decision making. You know, when is one explanation better than another? When does an explanation contribute to a decision? When does an explanation engender trust? So they're there to just try to dig out the nuggets from all of that psychological literature and make it available to the rest of the team. So I've got, like I say, got a variety of techniques being applied. Several people, you know, going after deep learning in particular but have other people trying different techniques. This group at Dallas is using tractable probabilistic logical models. It's kind of a variation of Markov logic nets 
where if you can train the system, you end up with a very structured uh, result that you can actually do reasoning with. It's not as opaque as a deep learning system. Have other teams like uh, Charles River and Rutgers in particular who are, not, who are trying to do something that's model agnostic. They're not trying to open up the black box and understand what's happening inside of it, but they can experiment with it and see if somehow they can infer a model that explains the decisions the system is making. So we've got this variety of techniques, and basically for the rest of the talk, I'm going to give you some examples of different techniques these people are trying, first both for the explainable model then we have done just the first round of initial evaluations, show you just samples of some of the data we're getting out of these experiments. So here's one. Here's the, the most obvious, you know, uh, somewhat simplest technique to apply, ones that a lot of people are already using that develop deep learning systems, and that is to create a heat map or a salience map of what part of the data is the AI system paying attention to when it makes a decision. So here's a simple example. Here you fed this overhead video, overhead image to a system, and it said, I think this is a solar farm. Now, it doesn't look much like a solar farm, so the user might want to know, why did you make that decision? So first, I asked the system, why did you think it was a solar farm? And the heat map says, well, this, this bright area on the roof is what looked like a solar farm to me, but if you ask, well, then why would you look at the alternative to think it's a shopping mall and you find it's really looking at the parking areas and the, you know, kind of perimeter of the, of the shopping mall, which it probably is, and that gives, even that, by just looking at, the, at what input it's paying attention to, can often give the user a pretty clear idea of what the system is doing right or wrong and what it's thinking about. Doesn't always work, but it's a, a great initial explanation to use. Here's another technique. I mentioned the group at Rutgers that's just treating the system like a black box. What they're trying to do is find out what are, rep, what are the most representative training examples that caused the system to make the decision it did. So this is a picture of a test that they're using for their evaluation. So they'll show a user an image like this, say is it category A or category B? What do you think the system, how do you think it will classify this? and then gives representative examples of category A and category B, right? And so then the user, by looking at those examples, can often get an intuition, get an idea of what the system is going to do. But they don't try to dig into the internals of it. They have a variety of Bayesian methods where they can look at the training examples that are most like the example that's being decided on and pull out the most representative examples. Now here, start digging into the net. Here's uh, some interesting work that's done at MIT who are subs to Raytheon BBN. Uh, done this extensive work on what they call network dissection. So what you have here are the standard five convolutional layers of AlexNet. It's one of the popular you know, deep learning systems that analyzes images and, and scenes. Now the system has been trained not to recognize all these objects, just to recognize places. Just to, just to say, oh, this is a meeting, this looks like a meeting room, or this looks like a beach, or this looks like a sporting event. And, and, but when they dig into that, even though it was only trained to recognize these aggregate categories, you know, at the very bottom, the very decision nodes at the top bottom, they can inspect all the layers in between in which these bar graphs are showing are the number of human understandable concepts that it's recognizing in each layer, right? So there's actually a node in here that recognizes sky. There's a node in here that recognizes trees, right? So it just naturally uh, recognizes these reusable concepts. There's a node in the network that's lighting up for that concept. It just has no idea what to call it. So that's, you know, some indication there is explainable grist inside these systems, then the trick is how do you label it, how do you communicate that to the end user. Now the bad news is this only happens for like 30% of the nodes. There's all these other nodes that are very vague, distributed, hard to explain concepts. So it's not a perfect solution, but it just there is a lot of explainable material buried in these systems if you can pull it out. 
So then what people will do, here's also the Raytheon team, all this, this work is at UT Austin, is now you train a second deep net system to translate the nodes in the first net and turn it into language. Much like uh, a lot of work has been done on captioning images, right? And that's actually two deep learning systems, a convolutional net that analyzes the image, a recurrent neural net that translates the nodes in that image to words. So they're trying to extend that to create more complete explanations. So here they have uh, these two images of different food and they're asking, is this a healthy meal? So the verbal description is, well, because it's a hot dog with a lot of <laughs> toppings and they correctly recognize this delicious hot dog is not good to eat. Uh, and then in the second case says, yes, this is good because it contains a variety of vegetables and it highlights you know, the vegetables in the image. So now you combine the salience map with something that tries to translate the concepts inside the net and give you an explanation. Then I'll show you a few examples of how the team has used this technique where it worked and where it didn't work. So here they've asked, the, showed this video and said, what city is this? The system actually gives the wrong answer and says London, okay? But the explanation is because there's a double-decker bus, right? So clearly, you know, where the mistake was, this is actually somewhere in Washington, D.C. That's not a double-decker bus. It made that mistake, which then caused it to uh, make the wrong decision that it was London. So it was the wrong answer, but it's very informative, this kind of explanation, let the end user know where the problem is. But it's not always perfect. Sometimes the system just goes completely off the rails. So here's a question. What country is this? Its predicted answer is USA. Who knows? But its bizarre explanation is the sign on the word France, right? So it's just, if you've ever used one of these deep learning systems to generate language, it often generates perfectly formed coherent sentences, but can also often generate just complete you know, nonsense, right? Like this example. So those are pros and cons of, of that technique. Now here's another one that's a, a variation of both the salience technique and kind of understanding internal nodes. As of you work in machine learning and AI know, GANs are a hot topic, you know, generative adversarial nets. We have the problem that all the researchers want to do GANs whether it's relevant to XAI or not. And, and these guys happen to find a way to shoehorn it in to use a GAN to help create an explanation. This is a group at Toronto that's a sub to SRI. So what you have here, first we have the image of a bulldog, which is correctly labeled as a bulldog, and there's the heat map showing it's paying attention to the right spot. But now you can use the GAN to ask it to change that image in different ways. So in this case, it says, okay, keep the bulldogness, keep that node that, that lit up the bulldog, but change the background. Generate a different background that still retains the classification of bulldog so it can generate this kind of fuzzy background image. So it, like the salience map, it kind of gives you an idea of what it's paying attention to and what features pop out as important. But then you do the inverse of that and say, okay, change the image so there's no bulldog. And now it generates this, you know, simulated background that kind of replaces where the bulldog was and the bulldog classification goes away. So that's another example of how you can try to create a modified attention map to see what the system is paying attention to. Now change to autonomy. So as I said, now these people are trying to not just do classification on some data, but they're actually training a deep learning system to play a game or take action or have a decision policy. And to get started, most of the people have used well-known video games where a lot of this deep learning research has been done. So this is a group at Oregon State who have a, and most of these teams have kind of large multifaceted explanation systems. I'm just kind of picking out some nuggets to give you some of the interesting uh, uh, tricks people are trying. What they've done, this is a variation of trying to pull out some informative features out of the net. They have a technique they call quantized bottleneck networks. 
Basically, it means you take these gray nodes would be the conventional deep learning system that's being trained to make decisions. At the right spot in the architecture, they insert very few bottleneck nodes, if you will, and those can learn a simplified model of what the rest of the node, rest of the system is doing. And actually, in these cases, they've been successful in pulling out a finite state machine that kind of represents the overall decision strategy that the system is using. So here they had this system play Pong. They could find out what would be a very complex, large, uh, deep learning system of many layers. There are these three states and those transitions that it's really following. You know, where's the paddle? Where's the ball? You know, when do you, when do you move? When do you not? Right, that sort of thing. Here's a bowling game where similarly they, they had more states in this one where the system is trained, you know, to, to bowl. And once they pulled out this state machine, they were able to discover something the developers of the system did not realize, which was this system actually doesn't pay any attention to where the pins are. It's just learned that the best strategy is to bowl it straight down the alley every time and not worry with trying to make splits or, or whatever, right? And that was not apparent until they were able to pull out this more explainable model, if you will. Um, here's another one where it played a Frogger-like game. And again, here, they found out it wasn't paying attention to where the traffic was at all. It would just at regular increments would jump up, you know, to the next level. And on average, that worked as well as any strategy, right? So you really got some interesting insight into these things that way. Um, here's another one from Carnegie Mellon, a different approach, which actually addresses two of... Uh, two of the problems that, that you can get out of these systems. So here they've trained a system to play uh, Breakout, another one of the popular deep learning games that people train these systems to do. And, and, in, and normally you train it from just watching the pixels. You don't have any understanding of the game. You know, you can just feed the pixel image to one of these deep learning systems and it eventually figures out how to play the game right? Where, where it gets a reward. How does it work the paddle so it, so it does the breakout? What this yellowish orange line is showing, these are the number of training examples it needs, the number of games it needs to play in a conventional deep learning system before, you know, it reaches human performance, which is, which is up here. Now what Carnegie Mellon has done is tried to find, figure out a way that you can insert into the deep learning process some basic physics knowledge. And of course, this is also one of the grand goals in the whole learning community is how can you combine knowledge that people know ahead of time with these systems, you know, what people used to put in old rule-based systems, but it's very hard to mix that in the deep learning process. So they've developed a technique they call differentiable physics, which is basically they can take the deep learning system, they can insert nodes in the deep net that have this physics knowledge pre-trained and that then not only does it give you something that's more explainable because you understand the physics moves at that system, but it's able to learn in orders of magnitude fewer training examples. So it accomplishes, you know, as you'd expect, if you can jumpstart one of these systems with basic physics knowledge, it knows how rigid bodies work. It knows how the ball is going to bounce off the paddle. It doesn't need to relearn all that from scratch. So that's uh, one interesting technique that they're using. And here's an unexpected um, result that th this team had to, had to work on. Is Charles River Analytics have UMass and Brown University are their subs. So this is one of the groups that was not trying to understand the internals of the system. They just wanted to experiment with it and see if they could learn a causal model that explains what it was doing. So they would take one of these systems, perturb it in some way, and then see what it would do. So one of the, this is a, you know, a, a, um, another one of the video games, a Pac-Man-like one called Amadar. So one of the first things they did is said, okay, let's manipulate. We've trained this system to play the game. It's doing human level performance on the game. Let's perturb it. Let's add a line segment. Let's start it in a random place instead of the beginning. Let's add a line segment. Let's remove the enemy. Let's uh, shift an enemy from, for a different location. And they found a surprising result. The system would often just completely fall apart 
if you may, it was not really learning a general strategy for the game, but often kind of memorizing a lot of initial moves or something. And if it didn't have that, uh, the game was not in the situation it understood, it would just break. So at first they're like, well, how are we going to explain this? You know what I mean? So it's a, it, but what they were able to do then, oh, and this is showing um, for some of these different manipulations, how the, you know, how the performance changed, basically. So the worst was this random start. The next worst was the uh, fill in a new line segment, right? Some of these other things like add a line segment were not as bad. So, you know, they could kind of measure the effect these manipulations had. So then what they did was discovered that they could find a measure that would tell them how close this situation was to its closest training example. So it's kind of a measure, not exactly of confidence, but just a measure of how familiar or unfamiliar was this situation of the deep learning system. And that's a very useful um, uh, feature to its describe to a user, right? We're not sure what this thing is going to do, but it's completely out of its envelope, right? We, it, it's very different than anything it's been trained on. So the user gets an idea of when to trust it. What these graphs are showing, these are, so they had this Euclidean distance. They measured it by, they took the deep learning system, they cut off the top layer where it's been trained, and they just look at the second to the top layer. And if I can get a metric out of those weights at that layer that could tell you how close it is to a similar situation. So it's been in that situation before, means they would have seen exactly those same weights at that you know, second to the top feature layer. And these are just showing for all those different situations we described, you know, what those distance measures look like. And these two yellow and orange ones that are the furthest apart were the two most difficult, you know, assist, uh, uh, interventions I showed on the previous chart. So here um, is a Berkeley group again. This is some of the most, more interesting, kind of more ambitious efforts. Uh, and Berkeley, again, they're one of the groups that say, well, the way out of this is more deep learning. We're not going to, you're going to train the system to make a decision. We're going to train a second deep learning system to generate the explanation. So what this is showing at the top here, they've first trained a, um, a deep learning system, just mimic a human driver. This is not something out of a Google car or some autonomous vehicle. They just, for the sake of the research, trained a thing to mimic how a human drives in this simulated environment. They can then look at what that system is doing. They have a situation. They can get a heat map like the ones we you know, talked about before to see what features in the environment is the driving system attending to, what's making it make the moves that it does. <clears throat> they, next, they have, through crowdsourcing, through a bunch of similar scenes, crowdsourced with people to have a model of what do people pay attention to in street signs, right? So they would know that, you know, the sign is important in the traffic or whatever. So they've learned another model of what features does a person think is important. And then they use some of the text generation techniques <clears throat> that I described. So then when the system is driving, they look at what is it paying attention to? What would a person think is important? Now let's generate a verbal description of the intersection. What features are there that a person is interested in that the system is paying attention to and then generate a simple narration that describes the, the decisions the system's making? So here's some examples. Here's the explanation. The car slows down because it's making a left turn. And then here's the video and sure enough, you see the car kind of making a left turn. You can see the heat map there. There are a couple metrics they have on how close is the system to the human driver and that sort of thing. Here's another one. The car accelerates because the light turns green and traffic is moving. And sure enough, if you can see it, there's the green light. See the car next to it that's moving. So it's a pretty good description of, uh, understandable description of why it's made that, that, that maneuver. Here's a couple more. The car slows down because the car in front of it stopped. It's pretty easy, and sure enough, that, and we had to white out the license plate, we realized at the last minute on that. 
<clears throat> okay? The car slows down because there's a stop sign. Now, in this case, it actually makes a mistake. This is really a do not enter sign that it misrecognized as a stop sign, but it's still not a bad kind of explanation. So this is, um, you know, some kind of very initial work they've done, although at least in the Berkeley case, they also have a pretty large uh, center of um, autonomous driving. You know, got a lot of the auto companies are investing in a big research center there. So in the next phase of the program, they're going to actually mix this, these techniques up with the groups working on the, the for real autonomous driving stuff and see if you can find useful explanations there. Okay. Um, so that's samples of what people are doing in terms of an explainable model. Okay. Now, like I say, we're halfway through the program. We just had a meeting in February where all the teams in the first phase were asked to do an evaluation of their techniques to see if they actually helped a human user in different problem situations get a better understanding of, of the system. So this, what you're seeing in this model here, this is a model that the psychologist at IHMC put together to kind of just think through what are the cognitive steps that are happening when a person's using an XAI system. So you uh, have the XAI system, the user gets his explanation, that then hopefully helps him create some kind of mental model of what the system is doing. That mental model should help him perform the task that he or he and the machine are trying to do, and all of that will help him have appropriate trust of when to to trust or not trust the system. So that's the, the yellow nodes here describe the process. The green nodes are all the different things that can be measured, right? So you can look at just ratings of satisfaction. Did the user like the explanation? You can try to test his understanding of the mental model. This is often done by asking them to predict what they think the system would do in some new situation. Um, and then finally, if the person and the computer are performing some task, you can measure how effective they are at doing that task, and then, and then you can measure appropriate trust. Does this person know when to trust this system in the future and when not? So all of those are the kind of measurements we're trying to get at to see what effect using the explanation would have. So all the, all the teams were asked to run an experiment where they presented their XAI system to users. They would show it without the explanation, with the explanation, and usually with some sort of partial explanation to see which parts of the explanation were having the biggest effect. And um, so now I'll, it's very hard to summarize everything that happened. This is kind of some overall numbers on, you know, there's 23 separate uh, studies of all the different teams. Most teams did multiple studies. Amazingly, 5,600 participants. A lot of those were Amazon Turkers, right? But often it was a group of dedicated people. Uh, 11 unique explanation types, three machine learning tasks, or three user machine tasks, although I think that number is low. Something like 16 hypotheses confirmed, a lot of them tested. And so it's very hard to summarize. As you, as you guys know, do these experiments. Every one of these things is completely unique. The result you get depends on all sorts of details in the experimental design. What task did you use? So it's hard to kind of create any kind of overall summary. But I'll try in this aggregate chart, which is very approximate, right? So I would not take this too seriously. But saying, here's all of our teams. Um, the ones that tested a user satisfaction rating, they're the ones, if it's grayed out, they just didn't do that measurement, right? So as you'd expect, you know, almost all cases, users like the explanation. They preferred having it. Once in a while, there was an issue with information overload if somebody created an overly complex, you know, explanation. But, but with those exceptions, people like that. Of course, one of the things we're really going after is this prediction measurement. Does the user, does the system help the user understand the system well enough that he can predict what it will do in a new situation? So we got a few teams showed that. A lot of the teams had, you know, no significant difference. There even may be a very minor, you know, improvement from explanation, but it was not statistically significant. So that proved to be difficult to do. 
it's often because there was a seed, that because the task was so easy, the user could make the prediction without the explanation, especially if it was about looking at an image, and a person can generally look at the image and they have all the information they need. So <laughs> it's one of the things we're trying to prove in the next phase is make these tests more complex, right, so the, the power of the explanation shows up. Uh, measured trust, in a few cases, task performance. So that's kind of a little scatter plot of, you know, different results we had. I'll show you then a few examples of uh, some of the interesting findings. So here's kind of a typical finding here. This is uh, Raytheon BBN and their subs at Georgia Tech who ha also have a salience model called GradCam that they were developing. They developed a game called Guess Which, or maybe it's out in the community, where the task is a user is shown uh, an array of images. The computer has picked one that it's its target. Now the user's task is to figure out which image is the target, and the only way he does that is to look at the explanations for each image. So should the, the you know, if it works, the explanation should help the user figure out what this target image is, you know, faster, more effectively than without the explanation. So this bar graph here is showing what they discovered. This was, you know, basically without the salience map and without the text explanation. So they're generating both the salience map and a textual explanation. Just the salience map didn't make much difference. There was a slight increase, you know, after they added the salience map, but not as much as adding the text explanation where you really got a significant difference. So it kind of sample of one, of one of the results they had. They did an earlier study where they found poorly done salience map actually confused the user more than helped, right? So it's, it's a little tricky to get these things, you know, in all situations to work. Here's another one from the group at Rutgers who was generating examples, right? And they had a very rich, well-structured experiment. This is a card-carrying experimental psychologist that did this work, and his studies are beautiful, if you want to, right? Really well done, um, which is not always the case with computer scientists, I've discovered. They are not always as good at this. Um, so they had a whole bunch of different conditions, but one of the things that showed up, if they looked at what was the effect of the explanation when the system was correct versus the explanation when the system was not correct right, and found that when the system was correct, there wasn't much difference. I don't think there was, actually, a little bit better without explanation, although that was not a significant difference, right. Again, there was kind of the ceiling effect, I think. It was so easy to see why it was correct or kind of had the obvious conclusion that the explanation didn't help, but the explanation really paid off when the system was incorrect, which is what you'd really hope for. That's when a person really needs it, right. So that was a nice result although there were other studies that found there was not much help, right? Were found if the problem was hard enough, you could get some effect from the explanation when the system was correct, but when the system was incorrect, it, the explanation doesn't always help. But this was an encouraging result. Um, here's a similar result from SRI. They had a whole range of explanation components. So this is no explanation. They had an attention map. Uh, another kind of feature they added to look at activities. They had like a, a semantic ontology that could be used to explain it. They could uh, d identify different object attributes. And then this is all the explanations combined. So what they found is, well, again, when the system is right, it almost didn't make any difference. It kind of had this ceiling effect. They, you know, any of these conditions produced uh, the same result. But when the system was wrong, Here's without explanation, right? You got several of these cases. You know, actually, interestingly, this one was a little bit better than having all the explanation components. But they did find, you know, a lot of cases where the explanations were helpful. And now here's one you won't be able to read, but I'll talk you through it. This was one of the most disturbing result, or part of this is the most disturbing result. What you're showing here, they've got two sets of graphs. This one is basically the prediction performance, you know, how well the user understand what the system was doing. The x-axis here is by the user rating how helpful the explanation was. So not surprisingly, if it was helpful, 
it really did help his performance. As the, as the explanation got less helpful, his performance degraded, right? Although the interesting thing here is in a couple cases, if it was really terrible, his performance went back up a little bit. And their explanation here was, if the explanation was so bad, then the user spent a lot of time kind of digging in to the case and actually ended up with a better understanding, you know, of what was going on. Now, we didn't get that effect over here. This is the most disturbing part. So here again, the y-axis is his performance on the predictions. This is how accurate the explanation was, right? Not whether the user thought it was helpful, did it really match the ground truth. They had to have people come in and inspect it. And, that's a pri and this red line, I think, is the average. Uh, what is showing here, of course, when the explanation is accurate, the user's performance goes up. But when the explanation is inaccurate, it goes down. It goes down a lot further than it goes up from a good explanation. So it's just a case where the bad explanation can really kind of contaminate and ruin the effect that a good explanation has. So there's clearly something we'll need to do to moderate this, right? To, you know, to not give an explanation if it's too uncertain or, or whatever. And again, you know, all of these results depend on the million details for that particular experiment. I don't have generalizable results, I don't think, for all these kind of charts. So that's um, some samples of the results we got. And then finally, this is where we are in the program. As I say, it's this uh, two-year program. We're just about halfway through. We have, uh, all the teams have done, you know, in some, some cases very painfully gotten through their first evaluation. They've, some cases, learned to do a decent experimental design, learned a lot about what's a good task and what's not a good task, learned a lot about how to structure these evaluations. So now we'll take another run at those evaluations the end of this year and the end of next year, have more results like this to publish, and we hope and already see as we get closer to the end, there's going to be useful techniques here. We'll pick out the things that are look most promising, uh, either add more DARPA funding to insert it into a DOD system, or we have several venture capitalists that come to these meetings kind of hungry for some nugget to go insert into one of their products, right? So, I, you know, as, as this goes on, I think you'll see more of that happen. Um, Something else I thought I was going to say, but maybe not. Uh, at any rate, so that's, uh, that's kind of where we are. You know, we've got some pretty interesting results. I think we've got a ways to refine this stuff and really uh, package it up. Now, I wish I had one single report that described all these results. I don't, right? Almost all of these teams are publishing things on their own, right? So if you're just watching, you know, AI and HCI conferences and journals, You'll probably see these things pop up. I am going to try in the next couple months to have some kind of consolidated report on the DARPA website that at least give you pointers to, you know, the result, the studies that each one of these teams individually did. So you can look for the DARPA website for that, or if you don't see anything in a couple months, send me an email, you know, and uh, I'll say what an irritating thing to ask me to uh, give you these results I promised but we'll do my best to get that done. Okay, thanks. So thank you, Dave. Great talk. So we have some time for Q&A. So if you have a question, um, please introduce yourself and also say your affiliation. So are there any questions? Uh, Tom Ye, Colorado, University of Colorado Boulder, and it's a great talk. I'm curious if you can comment on the differences you might have been observing between two challenged problems in terms of the approaches or hmm. obstacles. Hmm. Sure. Um, uh, data analytics and autonomy, right? Right. Those two and, challenged problems. Yeah, and they're, uh, you know, very different machine learning techniques, if you will, with the autonomy one being a lot more complex, needing a lot more data. Right, so that's one, you know, you just, why most of this research is done in games because you need to have some environment, a simulation environment or a game where you can repeat 
you know, the episodes over and over and over again, right? So that big obvious difference, and that's true of, you know, learning the explanation as well. The other thing is, I'm not sure if this is what you're getting at, I can see a lot of applications for the data analytics one. You know, a lot of people already have that problem. These systems are out there doing classification, doing predictions. In DOD, all, all sorts of intel agencies want this technology. In the autonomy case, I think that's a little bit further out, right? Because it's uh, just for a variety of reasons, it's a lot slower to get these completely autonomous systems like autonomous vehicles out on their own. And even after that happens, these new deep reinforcement learning techniques are really just in, you know, kind of academic research environments now, other than playing Go and Atari and, and that sort of thing. I think it'll be a while before those things come out. Now, the, uh, another interesting difference, the, uh, the Carnegie Mellon Group has a nice talk on this. They say, you know, the traditional autonomous system is a set of very well-designed modules. There's a perceptual module. There's some, you know, state estimation module. There's a control module. There's a variety of output modules. And what the, the most extreme cases, people doing deep reinforcement learning, they just don't have any kind of modules. They just throw everything at the deep reinforcement learning system and let it learn it all, right? They're very skeptical that will ever be, and we have people in the, and doing our research doing both. The, I, you know, a lot of people think that's never going to be applied, right? You're never going to have an autonomous car that's just completely trained by scratch by one giant deep net. You always have to have these modules. So that's why they're trying things like this differentiable physics so they can create different techniques that would work with each module, but you don't have this gigantic soup, you know, of interconnected stuff. Yes. Uh, Peter Brusilovsky, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, thanks for a really exciting talk. Looking forward to look at this web page in, in, in a few months. Uh, so now, it looks like the majority of cases which you present in the talk are related to recognition AI and deep learning, uh, right. although there are many different kinds of AI. Yes. And if right. you look at, uh, right. there's a lot of work in the community which also recognizing the importance of explanations, and it looks the majority of work focusing on explanation of recommender systems, probably because recommender system is right. something which facing the world more closely, right. many kind of user. Is it not covered by your program? It looks like the program is looking for really a very special kind of AI, or just misinterpretation because the most exciting results appeared in this uh, nearly. No, yeah, I think that we had to pick, you know, when you're creating a DARPA program, you want to try to create the right focus for it, right? We just can't do it all, right? So that's, you know, and, there's so much work in deep learning on images and video, and that, so that's kind of where we pick that, you know, domain and autonomy for, for obvious reasons. So there are just some things we left out, right? And, and uh, I understand there'll be a session on AI and recommender systems later on uh, that, you know, there's a lot of interesting work going on everywhere, and we just couldn't cover it all. Okay. Hi. Uh, yes. Dennis Parra from Catholic University in, in Chile. So, um, at the beginning, you show a motivation with very important and possibly impactful domains like healthcare, military, right, right. finance. The examples you show are very interesting, the results, but it didn't seem to be still on, on those uh, critical domains. So, within the project, the program, uh, is there the case that you are going to expect results on those particular domains? Yeah, well, one, first, it's, of course, these are mainly... Uh, University research groups and one simple problems that, you know, to start with, right? Although even there, there are some, as the program, as the techniques play out, you know, they are, will be applied more and more to these problems. Like the first salience map I showed you from Berkeley, they've now worked with people at, I can't remember which medical school, to actually apply that, you know, to radiologists reading, uh, you know, medical images, right? And shown that that, you know, has payoff in that environment. And then likewise, uh, one of the teams does a, already has a sub that does a lot of work with U.S. Uh, intel agencies, so they're interested in taking some of these techniques and trying it out in their system. So we'll do more and more of that as the technology kind of gets more mature. Yes. 
Uh, following up, I was wondering, because uh, in some of the initial slides you had description of different types of explanations from yes. a human perspective, when, why, when right. it would fail, and so on and so forth. And you would imagine that depending on the situation and the domain, some of those could be more important than others. Right. But towards right. the end, when you were talking about evaluations, you had this box, explanation, and it was kind of, you know, uh, very... Um, Right. underspecified. So I was right. wondering if part of the program, one of the objective would be to understand how the different techniques might be able to map onto these different types of explanations and when right. they would have to come into play given the domain and user yes. objectives and so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And actually part of the reason for this 12th team was just help us think through how to even measure what's an effective explanation, right? There are so many dimensions to this. As you're saying, every user in every situation is different, right? So, you know, what we're doing to approach that, I guess, you've got such a variety of things people are trying. You know, we hope that over time you'll learn, you know, some general principles about, uh, you know, when does a certain type of explanation apply? Although you've got very different techniques. A lot of people really want to go after theory of mind and understanding what these users already know and now you tailor the explanation, others are not looking at that at all, you know, just uh, give a basic, you know, average explanation and, and then let the user dig in with more questions. So I think that's a good point. I think there's just, that's such a rich space. We're just trying a lot of different techniques in different situations and, and see what comes out of that. Okay. We have a question in the back. Hi, thanks for your talk. I'm Nira Jane from Purdue University. Um, I just is kind of building off of the last question. To what extent are the current teams, for example, looking at I, maybe adaptive XAI? So to what extent are they thinking about, uh, it looks like the algorithms themselves obviously are working at sort of each repeated trial within a game or a scenario. Right. Um, is there anything being used from previous trials, if you will, to sort of update how that explanation uh, is being given? Okay, very good question. Yeah, we, we're hoping that not only would people look at with an explanation and without an explanation, but could track the user's understanding over time. You know, with the, for one, with the idea that if you're using an autonomous system, after a while you develop a mental model, you know, of how it works, we would hope the explanation would accelerate that, right? So you get that understanding much faster. Although we've had so much trouble just doing the first simple experiment, doing this longevity piece, you know, it's much harder to get done. Well, I hope to have, we do have one or two teams that have looked at that, right, to see the effect over time. The other thing is, it we has a similar problem. Could the explanation improve itself with more interactions from the user, right? Is the, is the explanation machinery adaptive? And there are a lot of the researchers would like to work on that, although it's, again, it's so hard to just get the first round of the explanation done. We haven't gotten very far on that. Any more questions? Hi, David. Shivali oh. from Park. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on the correctness of explanations. Mm -hmm. So today you showed that in the Frogger game, like the end-to-end -end learning system, like the team interpreted that as a single, like a state machine with a single state. And last yesterday we had this talk where like, you could still explain the behavior in very human understandable terms right. so that the human walks away with this understanding that they know what the system is doing. Right. But we don't know if that is actually what the system is doing. So I was wondering if you had sure, some perspective. Sure, sure. Well, and that's one of the main reasons we're trying to get this prediction task is one of the key measures, right? If does the system not, does the user not only think he understands it, but does he understand it well enough he can predict what it will do in a new situation? Yeah, very, I think it'd be relatively easy to trick someone into thinking they've got an explanation that's not accurate, right? So, you know, it's very, um, it, you know, it, it takes a lot of extra work to measure that, right? As we're finding it's difficult to get a situation where you can actually show the explanation improves prediction performance. But I think that's, that's the, the, the best thing we're trying to do to get at that. Hi, uh, Bart from Clemson University. Yeah. Um, I had a question going back all the way to the beginning of your talk when you showed 
the negative relation between performance and explainability. Right. And you gave us an example that, you know, the right. most brilliant people are not always very good at explaining. Right. Right. Which I don't really agree with that with that point. You know, well, I, I not, think it's not, not true in your case, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. so I, I think my main point is I don't think that the brilliance is necessarily the causal factor there. There's probably some oh, sure. third variable, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, right, right? So, but but regardless of that, I'm I'm wondering why is performance negatively well, related that, with explainability? Okay, and that's a good question. There are machine learning people that argue with me that that's not necessarily, if we got explainability right, you'd improve performance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So that, that's a hypothesis that's yet to be proven, I guess, right? So, you know, I think just we observe now there's just kind of a natural complexity of the largest deep learning systems that's very hard to simplify and convey. But it's like some of the teams I didn't mention in examples, are working on modular architectures for deep learning systems. So it's not this enormous web of interconnected stuff, but you're actually training it in a way there are understandable modules inside of it, right? Or maybe you get to the point that, you know, you've, you've recognized, you've changed the way these things are trained, you seed it with enough prior knowledge or whatever in a way that a person would understand, it might actually even have a better understanding of the problem, right? and have better performance. So yeah, I, I don't think that's, it's not proven that that's necessarily the case. That's just a conjecture so far. Well, if I may, a very quick follow-up to that. It's difficult for me to sometimes explain a difficult decision to a child, right? Now, what if a AI becomes so intelligent that it becomes difficult for the AI to explain to us? Well, that, <laughs> you know, that's part of the, not that it's necessarily more intelligent. You know, somebody wants me to characterize these things, they're like idiot savants from Mars, right? They, 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 they can do some incredible things, but their, their logic is so different. You know, and these deep learning systems are somewhat like that. Like I say, half the nodes are understandable, the other half are just some weird distributed concept that it picked up. And it might even be useful if it could explain it. To us, right? It might is like in deep uh, in, in AlphaGo, you know, the, in one of the games the system made this move on the fifth rank, or I don't play column or whatever, which, which an expert normally say is forbidden. Never do that. And now all the experts have discovered, gee, yeah, that's actually a good strategy. You know, AlphaGo had discovered that that was a legitimate approach. It was just too complicated in a way for a person to understand, but now that they have that insight, all the Go experts are, you know, exploring that technique. I have a last question. Okay. <laughs> it, it's more like a high-level question about, I mean, you are halfway through the program, right. right, and you are initiating a lot of great research in that area. So f what, what would be best case and worst case outcome? You know, in one oh, and a half sure. years, you know, where sure. you say, well, this sure. is the glorious goal I'm, I'm aiming for, and this is probably what I'm going to get. Um, worst case, I think we've accomplished, okay? That's good. <laughs> yeah, is, well, I put the X in XAI. That seemed that we created the program at a time when everybody was hungry for information about AI. We somewhat, I, I think it would have happened anyway, but the program has really stimulated not just this research, but all kinds of interest in research in the area. So I think that, even that, is a good outcome, right? Next best would be, you know, these programs continue. These are great researchers working on the program. They're all going to make discoveries that feed, you know, the uh, AI research community that people will build on. And so there's kind of normal uh, academic, you know, progress. Now the best is, I retire, leave DARPA, Two years later, some venture capitalist creates a company that Apple buys, speaking of Siri, right? And I wake up and see my program advertised by the Apple marketing department, right? As, uh, you know, having created something like that. So I don't, I don't think we'll get there with this technique, but it would be if some of these things are mature enough, they really find their way into medicine and DOD and autonomous Some products. Vehicles, right. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thanks. Let's thank the